Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Over the last six weeks, our congregation has been faithfully studying and praying the Lord's Prayer. We've heard this prayer flow from our lips and fall over our spirits each and every week. But if I'm being honest with you, every time I have sat down to pray today's portion of the Lord's Prayer, I find my prayer filled with more questions than the mere historic words of this well-known prayer. Questions like, God, what does it mean for your kingdom to come? And more specifically, what is your will that needs to be done? And God, what does it look like when earth is like heaven? Because my mere human brain is struggling and yearning to understand. The opening verses of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6 render us humble. We hear these words and perhaps experience the emotions of guilt and shame, knowing or realizing that at the core of humanity is the desire for applause and affirmation. This portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is both harsh and pointed. This warning stands as a guidepost for all who claim to be followers of Jesus. You see, Jesus is urging his disciples to not heed the desires deep within themselves, but instead to attune themselves to the desires of God. This warning is Jesus' response, or perhaps reaction, to the church. A reaction to those who claim to be Jesus' followers, but only because it brings them accolades and adoration. Instead, Jesus counters by specifying that the practices of righteousness, good works, and prayer need not an audience to be relevant. Rather, Jesus goes so far as to urge the disciples to do their good works in their praying in secret. But hear me. It's not that Jesus believes all righteousness should happen behind closed doors. No, actually, what I think is happening is that Jesus is attempting to grow the disciples' faith in a way that has the potential to transform the world. So it seems only fitting that on a Sunday when we are trying to understand what it looks like when earth looks like heaven, that we too might need to heed these words. For it's, as each, for it's as if each line of the Lord's Prayer carries weight, signaling that there might be something more for us to hear. And this historic prayer, once given as an example of a heart cry, is often now lifted in pious reverence. Yet my questioning questions deep within my soul lead me to believe that we, this morning, need to draw the curtain back and behold its magic once more. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But God, what does it mean for your kingdom to come? Perhaps to begin for your kingdom to come, your people must ready themselves not in anticipation of some far-off skies, but trusting that hope is soon to arrive. Your kingdom come speaks of little power or might, but much like the wisdom of Matthew chapter 6, your kingdom needs no loud or bright fireworks to announce its arrival. Instead, it comes when the doors are shut and the silence is thick. So like the Christians in the Bible... We must look to you not in prestige and honor, trumpeting your works, but instead to see you moving in the silence, healing at the margins and bringing affirmation to the wallflowers. For your kingdom come, well, it means we must be ready. Rare to toot our own horns, but faithful to be looking for you. For when God's kingdom comes, I believe that humanity will embody kindness. 
For when God's kingdom comes, I believe that hunger will be no more. When God's kingdom comes, I believe that political division will be nullified. When God's kingdom comes, I believe that the pigment of our skin won't matter because we'll all just be welcomed in. When God's kingdom comes, I believe that the cries of deprivation will turn to songs of gratitude. I believe when the kingdom of God comes, that all of creation will rejoice. For the kingdom of God is coming. And I have a feeling that it looks nothing like what anything humanity could have ever thought to dream. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But God, what is your will that needs to be done Well, in a world where malnutrition is more common than any plague, in a country where the population first identifies itself based on political party, in a place where global warming is threatening our ecosystem, in a country where the number one cause of death for children is gun violence, in a society where born identity seems to need liberation, and in a world where humanity is known more for their meanness than their kindness. It is easy to sigh the prayer, God, your will be done. Yet those words feel empty and lacking as they tumble from my tongue. To utter a quick, your will be done in response to the horrors of our world feels distant and uncaring. If all I do is pray, God, your will be done, and never join in the work of making it happen, then I am merely a noisy gong clanging in the wind. But this quick utterance, well, it's the common response to conversations around the will of God. We tend to hear this phrase and assume that it requires nothing of us because it is merely God's unfolding of what God has already deemed for humanity. But, but, a quick glance at the dictionary would tell us something completely different. It would offer us a new interpretation of the will of God. Marian Webster defines will in two ways. First, as the desire, inclination, or choice of a person or group. And second, perhaps my most favorite way is like this, as the faculty of wishing, choosing, desiring, or intending. So, according to this definition of will, the will of God is simply... God's desires or wishes for creation and for humanity, which somehow fills my prayers with God's will be done with a new kind of vigor. It leaves me less worried about a God who allows bad things to happen in order for the plans of creation to unfold and more concerned with a God who has big, bold, good, vibrant, hope-filled dreams for the world. Your will be done is not a sketched out plan coming to fulfillment, but rather it is creation finding its purposeful hope in our creator. For God's will to be done, our prayers for God's will must be partnered with our striving to see God's dreams for the world be manifested. And church, I hate to tell you, that this partnership runs deeper than any empty words that might tumble from our lips in a moment of exhausted prayer. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But God... What does it look like when earth is like heaven? 
One of my favorite theologians is the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu from South Africa. He's known for many great things, but my favorite thing that he is known for is his coining of the term God's dreams for the world. And he's written about this. If you have read any scholarship on him, you've probably heard this. This is his most well-known thing. He's written books and articles and been interviewed many times, but my absolute favorite part um, that I've ever read by him are in the form of children's books. And I know we have several of them here at the church. If you don't see them, find me. I have a whole shelf full of them. So I thought this morning, as we consider what it means for earth to look like heaven, that rather than me giving you some long, lengthy moment, I might just turn to someone who has written this all down in a way we might understand. So allow me to read this to you, because I think it may have something for us to know about what earth should look like if it looked like heaven. God's dream. Dear child of God, what do you dream about in your loveliest of dreams? Do you dream about flying high or rainbows reaching across the sky? Do you dream about being free to do what your heart desires? Or about being treated as a full person no matter how young you may be? Do you know what God dreams about? I'm sure if you close your eyes and look with your heart, I'm sure, dear child, that you will find out. God dreams about people sharing. God dreams about people caring. God dreams that we reach out and hold one another's hands and play one another's games and laugh with one another's hearts. But God does not force us to be friends or to love one another. Dear child of God, it does happen that we get angry and hurt one another. Soon we start to feel sad and so very alone. Sometimes we cry and God cries with us. But when we say we're sorry and forgive one another, we wipe away our tears and we wipe away God's tears too. Each one of us carries a piece of God's heart within us. And when we love one another, the pieces of God's heart are made whole. God dreams that every one of us will see that we are all siblings. Yes, even you and me. Even if we have different parents and grandparents or live in different faraway lands. Even if we speak different languages or have different ways of talking to God. Even if we have different eyes or different skin. Even if you are taller and I am smaller, even if your nose is little and mine is large, dear child of God, do you know how to make God's dream come true? It is really quite easy. As easy as sharing, loving, caring. As easy as holding, playing, laughing. As easy as knowing we are family because we are all God's children. So dear child of God, will you help God's dream come true? Let me tell you a secret. God smiles like a rainbow when you do. So what is it like when earth looks like heaven? Well, I believe it is knowing that the kingdom of God is coming. And it looks nothing like we could have ever imagined. And surprisingly, I think, it looks more like God than we ever thought to dream. So what is it like when earth looks like heaven? Well, I think it's the moment that you and I, the church, the family of God, the children of God, begin to embody God's dreams for the world by sharing, by loving, by caring, by doing. And don't worry, it's really quite easy. For it's simply earth as it is in heaven. Amen.